Welcome to the Reality Revolution. This is your host, Brian Scott. Today, we're going to do a deep dive analysis of Chapter 11 of the book Reality Transurfing, written by Vadim Zeeland. You do not have to listen to previous episodes of this podcast to listen to this. This chapter and the analysis is exclusive. There's no need to go back and understand anything. This chapter is from a very wonderful book, Reality Transurfing, which explores the ability to choose and create your reality. Vadim Zeeland is a physicist who has created a model of reality that is fascinating and powerful. I have several episodes where I've gone into deep dives on different chapters, and each one I've learned a lot by going through this process. This particular chapter is very important because we're dealing with energy. Energy is the key to manifesting, to creating and choosing realities that you want. And if you do not have control or an understanding of your energy, you will find these reality creation practices to be very difficult. This chapter summarizes how to use energy, how energy works, the energies of intention, protective shields. It talks about energy vampires and even has a section on pendulums that can pull you into illnesses. It's a powerful chapter and I learned a lot from it and I hope that you do too. If you get a chance, check out my energy meditation. It's about an hour and a half long with 30 minutes and I do go over some of these passages in that episode. I probably won't create a meditation around this chapter as I've already done that. In that particular meditation, I tried to bring in all kinds of different information about energy using chakras and meridians and I really liked it. It's a little bit long and I may create a smaller meditation after I do this, but deep inside of the content of this, you can really learn about how to apply and understand your use of energy if you are a fellow trans surfer. So this chapter starts with a quote, you do not have to fight for your health or store up energy, simply let it in. One thing this chapter does a good job is start talking about health in relation to trans surfing. And there's some pretty good sections in here that give you a better understanding of how to modulate your health when you understand energy. The first section of this chapter is energy levels. And as it says, to practice transurfing effectively, you have to be in a good state of health and have a relatively powerful energy field. You may think that your health is quite good as it is, but not really know what true health feels like. If you struggle to get out of bed in the morning and do not want to go to work or, or school, if you feel sluggish after lunch and find yourself nodding off and in the evening wish for nothing better than to plonk yourself down in front of the television, you cannot say that you're in good health. If this describes your lifestyle, your energy levels are clearly only sufficient to support a measured existence. You will already have additional energy by reclaiming the vitality that was previously being spent on the burden of excess potentials and pendulums. However, you can never have too much energy. And so later in this chapter, Zealand introduces a number of recommendations for ways to increase your energy levels even further. What we understand here by energy levels is the ability to absorb and use energy. There are basically two forms of energy in the human body, physiological and free energy. Physiological energy is attained via the digestive system and free energy is the energy of the cosmos that passes through the human body. Together, both make up our energy body. Human energy is spent on fulfilling various biological functions, but it also radiates out from the body into the space around us. If you're something, somebody that's just getting into transurfing or the law of attraction or meditation, you may come to it with the idea that your energy is only inside your body, that you need to drink coffee to get some energy. But when you come into the realization that there's energy outside and you can access and pull it into your body, everything changes. It really does open up the possibility to maximize your energy. There is an infinite supply of cosmic energy in the world, but as humans, we only absorb a tiny fraction of it. 
it passes through the body in two directions. Now, this is important. I try to integrate this into my meditations, understanding that the movement of energy goes in two directions in your body. The first current passes in an upward direction, and he has that in italics, and runs one inch in front of the spine in men and two inches in front of the spine in women. I I can't confirm that. This is what he says in the book, and we'll just accept that as his own piece of information. There's nothing that's really backing that, but I accept that. The second current of energy passes in a downward direction and runs very close to the spine. The amount of free energy a person has depends on the width of their central meridians. The wider the meridians, the greater a person's energy levels will be. The meridian system was discovered long ago. We are not going to delve too deeply into a detailed description of the structure of the human energy body here. If you're interested in this topic, there's plenty of relevant literature available. The circulation of energy around The human body is a relatively complex process, but that should not overly concern you. For our purposes, it is enough to concentrate on these two central meridians. A disruption in the normal flow of energy caused because somewhere blocks and holes have appeared can manifest in the form of physical illness. The opposite is also true. An inner organ that is affected by an illness can also distort the overall picture of the energy body. It is difficult to draw a clear distinction between cases where physiological symptoms such as toxicity in the body have caused problems in the energy flow and where disturbances in the energy flow have resulted in a physiological disorder. Acupuncture and acupressure and many other methods besides can help restore the normal circulation of energy in the body curing illnesses caused by poor energy flow. However, these methods can only guarantee a short-term effect in order to maintain a good state of health. One has to take care of the physical and subtle bodies. Human energy levels are closely linked with the condition of the body's muscles. Muscle tension hinders the normal flow of invisible currents which disturbs the transmission of energy throughout the energy field. So he's saying if you're working out at the gym and your muscles have tension, that it can distort your energy flow. I'm not entirely sure of that. Uh, Maybe he's making a distinction if the tension is caused by emotion. I'm not sure. But a person who feels tense can enter a relaxed group of people and change the general mood in the group without uttering a word. The tension just seems to hang in the air. The other people in the group absorb the negative energy without necessarily being aware of it. Tension creates inhomogeneity in the general field, calling up balanced forces as a result. Have you ever had somebody that came into a room and you can feel it? And that may be because of the tension that they carry in their energy field. I have become much more careful about who I spend my time with because any interaction with somebody, I'm also interacting with their energy field. Equilibrium can be reestablished either by bringing the group energy to a common denominator or by quashing the energy potential of the opposite sign. For example, the group may tease the overly inhibited individual who has recently joined them to get them to relax. Mood and vitality are directly linked to energy levels. Depression, stress, ennui, tiredness, and apathy all indicative a lack of sufficient energy in the body. Physiological energy alone is not enough to support high levels of vitality. A person can be feeling physically tired, but comfortable and cheerful at the same time. Likewise, a person who is well-fed and rested can feel down and listless. Free energy plays the most important role in assuring a person has a proactive approach to life. When a person has no desire to do anything, all they clearly lack free energy. A person may be able to force themselves to carry out routine functions on a background deficit of free energy, but they will find it difficult to be in creative or physically active. Intention is the driver for any proactive behavior, and yet when a person has no free energy, they can have no intention. Physiological energy is spent in the physical execution of our actions. Here we will focus primarily on the first type of energy that goes into creating intention. This is the effect of the energy of intention, and it is thanks to this energy that we experience the motivation to have and to act. 
If you're acting with intention but struggling with it, it may be because of your energy. And as he says, when a person has no free energy, they can have no intention. This is important. You must have free energy in order to have an intention. You may be in a process and struggling and look back and and, and let's look at your energy. And maybe that's the key to enhancing your intention. When a person is depressed or tense, their meridians become blocked. The section is stress and relaxation. Now the meridians narrow and the circulation of free energy either slows down or stops altogether. And this state of intention loses its energy supply. When intention is blocked, a person usually becomes incapable of dealing with stressful situations effectively. Stress can also have the opposite effect on the meridians, making them suddenly dilate. When this happens, a person is capable of doing incredible things that ordinarily they would never be capable of doing. There are known examples of this, although they are rare, in the majority of cases, and a person's abilities and resources are severely reduced when the body experiences high levels of stress. Every day, people come up against numerous stressful situations of varying intensity from fairly minor incidences that are usually quickly forgotten to extremely stressful situations which can knock them off kilter for quite some time. The body's natural response to stress is to tense one or another's muscle group. This tensing has become a deeply ingrained habit that we do not really notice. For example, whilst you read these lines or listen to this podcast. You are tensing individual facial muscles, but as soon as you pay attention to them, they relax. After a few minutes, you will forget about your face and it will freeze once again into a mask that reflects your emotional condition. Do you notice tensing in your body and face unconsciously? Start to really become aware of your body and notice it places where you tense There's an erroneous but widely held belief that stress can be relieved through relaxation. And by trying to relax, you are in effect railing against the symptom without eliminating the cause. Physical tension is caused by psychological tension. States of oppression, anxiety, irritation, and fear cause spasmodic muscle tension. Naturally, conscious relaxation of the muscles will give temporary relief but unless the mental tension is dealt with the body will reassume its previous condition to eliminate mental tension it is essential and sufficient for importance to be reduced the reason you are tense in the first place is because of the excess meaning you attribute to whatever is bringing you down once again Vadim Zeeland's fallback is the importance and while it may be sometimes he overly talks about importance in this particular case it is one thing to look at you're tense for what reason what is the reason that's causing you stress there's something that you're making important and your body is holding that importance importance ends up creating these balancing forces in your body it's pretty fascinating Meditation really helps to relax. It's a forced relaxation. But even in meditation, you're going to have that for an hour or so. So what you want to try to do if you meditate is to lock in these relaxation and create an unconscious habit of relaxation. I've tried to do that in programming and meditations because this relaxation is important to create a flow state in which your intentions are easily realized. Relaxation is pinnacle and important as I have found more important than you realize. Anybody that hypnotizes you will tell you that the secret to hypnosis is relaxation. Anybody that talks about accessing expanded levels of brainwave coherence will tell you that the secret is relaxation. Stress, if a consequence of importance, stress can be instantaneously relieved by reducing importance. So, As I've said in previous episodes, how do you do this? One of the best ways is to laugh. One of the best ways is to minimize the importance is to laugh about it. It is futile and harmful to create ongoing importance. You will never succeed in changing a situation for the better and acting effectively if you are carrying the heavy load of importance. 
When you are severely stressed, it is enough to wake up, open your eyes, and become conscious of the fact that a pendulum has hooked into your importance. Now, I've always wondered if there is a discrepancy in translation from Russian to English. As being in previous relationships with people that speak different languages, one word can mean completely different things and have completely different messages. And so I've always wondered if importance has a different meaning in Russian. A team, it seems too simplistic to me when talking about importance. Some things are naturally important. My kids are going to be important to me. I can reduce, as a mental model, the way I apply mental energy to it by reducing importance. And that's the key. I mean, I've talked to people about this and I've coached people and I've had the comment, there's some things you just can't reduce importance on. And the point is you're not necessarily reducing importance. You're not insulting anybody reducing importance. It is a mental hack to reduce balancing forces. By doing this, you're not saying that it's unimportant. You're telling your mind not to apply this energy. And as you get better and more advanced at this, it's not about the importance. It's how you apply the mental energy, at least in my own case. You will never succeed in changing a situation for the better and acting effectively if you're carrying the heavy load of importance. When you're severely stressed, it is enough to wake up, open your eyes, and become conscious of the fact that a pendulum has hooked into your importance. It is easy enough to see what the importance relates to in each specific instance. Remind yourself, by reducing importance, you free yourself of the pendulum and can act effectively. You have to be aware of the fact that attributing something inflated meaning will always work against you. To change any difficult situation, it is enough to remember about importance and consciously reduce any excessive meaning you have connected with it. The only challenge is to remember in time. When you are stressed, your awareness is sleeping, and so you will forget that something called transurfing ever existed. To eliminate stress, and this is in italics, to eliminate stress from your life, you have to wake up and reduce importance. If you have made a habit of paying attention to your inner voice, it will not be at all difficult to remember about importance at the necessary moment. Every time you experience a feeling of unease, ask yourself why, where has meaning been inflated? However important these specific circumstances are to you consciously, let go of your attachment to their importance. Only after the purification of intention can you act effectively. To become immune to stress, you have to replace the old habit of stressing out over any small thing with the new habit of maintaining a relaxed state. Now, for the for me, personally, if anybody knew me before you ever heard this podcast, this was a transformational moment for me. I'm an overthinker. I think deeply about subjects. And as a result, I constantly created importance. And I would constantly stress out about little things. Things would be a big deal that turned out not to be. And... And I was constantly creating balancing forces in my life. And so by reducing importance, I have been able to get into a, a flow state. And my, my, my regular daily experiences have been meaningful and better when I started doing this. Every time you experience a feeling of an ease, ask yourself, why? Where has meaning been inflated? However important the specific circumstances are to you consciously, let go of your attachment to their importance. Only after purification of intention can you act effectively. To become immune to stress, you have to replace the old habit of stressing out over any small thing with the new habit of maintaining a relaxed state. Being in a relaxed state does not mean being listless or apathetic. It is a state of harmonious interaction with the outside world. Balance. Balance presupposes the absence of internal and outer importance. I'm neither good nor bad, and the world is neither bad nor good. I am not pathetic and insignificant, and the world is not pathetic and insignificant either. Now, one thing that the one reason that this book is incredibly long is the Zeeland really repeats a lot of key areas of this book. And one of the things he repeats over and over is the balance. In, in many ways, 
if you're coming to this material as somebody that believes in the law of attraction, understand the best distinction, if I can summarize it quickly, between reality transurfing and, say, Neville Goddard or law of attraction is the law of balance. And it's taking into consideration the balancing forces of the universe. Check out my episode on understanding balance in transurfing. And also, please check out my episode, The Balance Forces Mind Programming. I have created a guided hypnosis to help you reduce balance to reduce importance and to access these balancing ideas into your mental habits and I, there i have had you know some notes and stuff that people have found that particular hypnosis to be successful in reducing balance a lot of people may not want to go directly to that because it sounds kind of boring but it's good to program your mind so that you have the initial reactions for a moment, because remember, your reactions are the key, and, and, and it's all about how you react in that little moment. That single reaction can flare out a grouping of energy. And so, to me, while understanding that importance is something that we don't want to reduce, how do you do that? And I've gone about creating that program to, re- to help modify that. The absence of importance, or at least a low level of importance, is the main condition essential to becoming relaxed. There is no point in trying to relax when importance is inflated. For example, you can hardly expect to be able to stay superbly relaxed when you're standing at the edge of a high rooftop and have a fear of heights. If reducing importance is not an option, you can at least avoid wasting energy on trying to relax. This can only increases your energy expenditure because as well as trying to control a critical situation, you are also holding back on what you feel, which is totally futile. Instead, let go and worry to your heart's content. For the practice of transurfing, you have to be able to swiftly induce a relaxed state in any circumstance. This does not require any verbal suggestions because the muscles are governed by intention and not words. The majority of the body's muscles can be relaxed consciously simply by being aware of them. And that is why meditations are so powerful because somebody is guiding you through each of the muscle groups and consciously allowing you to relax them. It can be enough, as Zeeland says, to simply scan your body with your inner eye to release any contraction. We do not usually focus our attention on our muscles until we experience physical discomfort. And so there will also be certain muscle groups that have forgotten how to obey intention. This is connected with the modern day sedentary lifestyle that most people lead. For example, it is difficult to control the back muscles consciously. And so with age, people tend to develop back pain. However banal it may sound, it is absolutely essential to regularly stretch and exercise the back. The whole procedure of inducing a relaxed state consists in the following. Without hurrying quickly, scan your body with your inner eye and release any contraction. Focus your attention on the entire surface of your body in one go. Imagine that your skin is a membrane that suddenly and rapidly warms through from the inside out. Focus your attention on the surface of your body. Imagine this stage in any way you like. Your skin is warming up, covered in a tingling sensation or electrical discharge. The important thing is to feel your skin. Now imagine the energy is sparkling all over the surface of your body like iridescence on a soap bubble. In this moment, you are part of the universe and are in perfect balance with it. There is no need to try and simulate any special sensation. Everyone experiences these things differently. There is no need to try at all. In fact, do the exercise as if in passing, but decisively nonetheless. The integral feeling you experience when you feel the entire surface of your body overflowing with energy is equivalent to a state of relaxation, balance, and oneness with the world. After you've practiced this exercise a few times, you'll begin to achieve this state instantly and soon induce a relaxed state will be as easily as unfolding your arms. The next section is energy vampires. 
Zeeland says we are all swimming in an ocean of energy. But accessing this energy is not that simple because it is not differently distributed in relation to man. To consciously access this energy, a person has to intentionally widen their meridians and consciously draw the flow into the body. You drink water consciously and intentionally but are unable to draw in energy with the same clarity of sensation. People are in principle capable of intentionally recharging from the cosmos but this ability remains limited to its embryonic stage. It is much easier to absorb someone else's energy that has already been assimilated by the human body than to draw energy from the cosmos. So-called energy amp vampires exploit this fact. The human form of energy is easy to assimilate because it has a specific frequency. To take someone else's energy, it is enough to tune into their frequency in the same way that an oscillation circuit radio does not pick up all the radio waves, but picks up those for which it is configured. Vampires feed on energy that has already been assimilated by other people and to do this they attune themselves to the frequency of the energy their victim is emanating. A vampire subconsciously finds various ways of attuning to the frequency of their victim's energy. An energy vampire may sidle up to you with innocent questions, stare you in the eyes, try to touch you, hold your hand or pester you with intrusive conversation. The energy vampire knows how to adapt and respond to character and temperament looking for a way of stealing into the victim's soul to get their frail. This is the behavior of the stealthy vampire and as a rule the energy vampire is a good psychologist, communicative but not charming as well as tenaciously intrusive. Usually this comes across straight away through being aware that their behavior is irritating the energy vampire will try very hard to present themselves in a different light. Another type of vampire is the manipulator. As you know the manipulator plays on the feelings of guilt. The manipulator vampire unconsciously seeks out people who are inclined to give themselves up to another's judgment or request advice when they are in a quandary. Anyone with the slightest guilt complex is likewise subconsciously searching for the one who will accuse and then immediately pardon them. Support and advice is sought by those who doubt their own convictions and are willing to give themselves up to another's judgment. So the vampire and the door find each other and fulfill each other's needs. The vampire and the donor. The manipulator easily attunes to the frequency of its victim. The technique here is very simple. The manipulator has only to touch the surface of the problem that is worrying their victim and they will open up immediately making the energy freely available. The third type of vampire, the provocateur, is more coarse and aggressive. Without really thinking about it, this type makes a direct assault on the aura trying to throw its victims off balance. You already know very well how provocateurs behave. They'll use it all means available to them from implicit bullying to overt aggression. Their priority is to make the donor lose it so their rudeness, irritation, resentment, fear and hostility gush from them. It does not really matter what the emotion is specifically anything will do. Now I'm, there are public figures right now that meet, meet the, the term of vampire as the provocateur then I'm not going to name names, but you can clearly see from that definition that that's going on. We see people in the public marketplace all the time that do this. People become energy vampires unconsciously, and their need to suck other people's energy is equally as unconscious. So they're not doing it on purpose. It's something that they're, they learn to do. So throughout their life, they notice that certain situations give them a lift and sense of a film fulfillment and they are compelled to create the experience. After a session, the vampire's donor usually feels very drained. So if after talking to someone you feel exposed, vulnerable, weak, or shaky, you can assume that your energy has been sucked. Now, have you met somebody and felt drained? Have you felt exposed or vulnerable, weak, or shaky? then there's a real possibility that person is taking your energy. They may not be doing it consciously, but be aware of it. That said, it is pendulums that take the lion's share of free human energy. 
We've described how they do this. Pendulums take energy through the importance meridian. Unlike the vampire, they may pose a threat for a short period of time. Pendulums can suck energy constantly the whole time a person is transmitting energy at the pendulum's frequency. So the greatest energy vampire is the pendulum vampire. These large informational energetic beings, if this is the first time you're listening to it, the pendulum is when more than one person's thoughts in a group form what is basically in an energy being that feeds on energy. We see it all the time with political parties and movements and even media. Anytime more than one person is talking about a specific topic and resonating at a frequency, it creates a pendulum. And this pendulum can take your energy. There's all kinds of pendulums that you're sucked into. Not all pendulums are bad, but the understanding of pendulums and energy is the key and why it's important. It's easy to say that pendulums can be good for you, but the key is understanding how you use your own energy towards those pendulums. Once you have a control of energy, then you can do great things. So I recommend that you try the pendulum meditation or or guided hypnosis that I have on this channel that will program your mind in how you give energy and to particularly to these pendulums. It's just a choice. And once you consciously become aware of it, you will not give energy to pendulums like you did before. When something is worrying you or bringing you down, your energy levels are weakened and other people and animals can into it. This is on an energy level, energetic level. And when your awareness and self-confidence are at a low point of all the other people walking along the street, the dog will choose to bark furiously at you. And the gypsy will choose you to pester and pressure into giving her your, your money. An energy vampire can take a good dosage of energy from you when your defenses are low. And you can easily find yourself drawn into a tricky situation. There is no need to start looking out for potential energy vampires in everyone you meet. So don't take this and immediately start looking at everybody as an energy vampire because it will work against you. By being obsessively cautious, you create access to your biofield, strengthening your energy body keeping an eye on your importance levels and developing conscious awareness will help protect you from negative influence. A developed awareness will help you to remain conscious in the moment that someone tries to pull you into a game or a trap. Maintaining a low importance level makes it much harder for someone to attune your frequency. You should always and should also remain very aware of any feelings of guilt that might plague you whilst an empty while whilst an empty there is nothing for anyone to hook into most manipulator vampires will leave you alone if they have made one or two unsuccessful attempts to hook you in to no avail and a strong auric field will provide you with reliable protection from any unwanted interference The protective shield. The human body is surrounded by an invisible energy field called an aura. The average person is not aware of feeling their aura, but they can imagine it. To sense your aura, feel the surface of your whole body like you do when you slide into a hot bath. Notice that I did not say try to feel the surface of your body. Just do it. When you dive straight in and do not assume that you must first try to do something before it will work, you will find that you can do it first time around and do not have to practice. Energy moves in a slow wave from the center of your body and then spills over onto the surface, forming a ball. Imagine a being surrounded by a ball of your energy body. It does not matter. You cannot physically touch it with your imagination alone. You have taken the first step towards managing your energy body. And with time, you'll begin to get a physical sense of it. Do you notice your aura? A lot of people don't. People who have psychic abilities can see auras as well as any defects in the aura. In fact, everyone has, everyone's born with extrasensory perception abilities, but they do not use them. And so the talent lies dormant. 
latent abilities can be awakened instantly or over a lengthy period of time by practicing exercises. It is all a matter of the power of your intention. Of course, it is not easy to acquire the full power of intention, but for our purposes, it is enough to have sufficient power of intention to keep your body levels healthy. A weak aura will always leave you open to the possibility of assault upon your energy field. This is something that people have been dealing with long before reality transurfing. And there are some particularly great ex exercises to cleanse your energy field, to protect your energy field that a lot of people have introduced that are very effective. You can develop and maintain healthy energy levels by regularly performing the following exercise. It is very simple and does not require much time. First, stand in a comfortable, relaxed position. Breathe in and imagine a flow of energy coming out of the ground, entering the perineal region and moving up the spine, roughly at the distance indicated earlier, exiting the head and extending upwards into the sky. Now breathe out and imagine a flow of energy is descending from the sky. The flow of energy enters the head, moves along the spine and passes out and down into the ground. You do not necessarily have to have a sense of the physical flow of the energy. It is enough to just imagine it. With time, your sensitivity will develop and you will learn to feel the energy moving. Next, imagine both currents moving towards each other simultaneously without crossing, each in its own meridian. At first practice on the in-breath, and the out breath but after a while try to get try to let go of trying the flows of energy to the rhythm of your breathing you can quicken the flow imbuing it with the power using the strength of your imagination intention now imagine that the ascending flow exits the body and pours downward over the head in a fountain shape similarly the under the descending flow exits the body and passes in the opposite direction directly under your feet you now have two fountains one above you and one below you mentally unite the spray of both fountains so that you are enveloped inside a sphere of energy then draw your attention to the surface of your body feel the surface of your skin and extend the same feeling out into the sphere like a balloon that gets bigger when you blow into it. When you mentally inflate the surface of your skin, the sphere created by the meeting of the fountains of energy becomes firmly established. You should remain relaxed throughout the exercise and avoid creating tension by trying too hard to feel the energy physically. Do not worry initially about not being able to get a physical sense of the central meridians. You're so used to them you've stopped feeling them just as you no longer feel at any other healthy inner organ from time to time practice regularly concentrating your attention on your energy currents and you will soon be come to a sense them physically perhaps not with the same immediacy as touch but tangibly nonetheless this is energy training by joining the currents into a sphere you create a protective shield around your body by extending the surface energy of the body into a sphere, you strengthen the shield until it acquires a stable condition. This exercise is invaluable. I will create a short meditation to do this exercise. So you can it'll be accompanied with music and you can expand your energy field. Maybe it'll be five to ten minutes. And we'll keep an eye out for that. And then you can just regularly use this to expand your energy field. First, the shield protects your energy from being undermined. Second, by training your energy levels, you cleanse the subtle meridians. The blocks that prevent the flow of energy dissipate and the holes in the aura that cause energy to be lost close up. This is a gradual process. Nothing is going to happen just like that. On the other hand, you will save yourself from constantly having to seek assistance of psychics and reflexologists being able to restore the healthy circulation of your energy independently. You should be aware 
that of itself your energy body will not protect you from vampires and pendulums because the freeloaders pump energy by adjusting their settings to your frequency. When a pendulum tries to hook into its prey, the victim's state of balance is undermined. In this moment, you have to be awake, be awakened and wake up and reduce importance if you are to defeat the pendulum. Then the muscles will relax. Your energy levels will restore to a state of balance and the pendulum will fall through into emptiness. If you're not swaying, the swaying pendulum cannot take your energy. Consciously, conscious awareness is essential if you are to develop control in moments when you involuntarily lose your inner balance. Increasing your energy levels does not involve accumulating large reserves of energy. This might sound a little strange because you, we are so used to popular phrases such as I do not have enough energy or I'm full of energy. Only physiological energy can be stored. All you have to do is eat good and get enough rest and the energy is stored as calories. However, the human body has no way of storing free energy which it takes from the, from the cosmos. If a person's meridians are wide enough, they will run free energy. But if they are narrow, the flow of energy will be impaired. So high energy levels, first and foremost, depend on the width of the meridians. Free energy is permanently present in a limitless quantity at every point of the field. You can literally take as much as you can carry. You have to learn to draw in free energy and experience yourself as part of the universe. And rather than doing it once, you should work to establish a continuous feeling of oneness with the world around you on an energetic level. People think that if they build up huge energy reserves, they will become strong and successful. They try and accumulate energy as a way of preparing to impact the outside world with inner intention. As you already know, the attempt to alter or conquer the world by force is a difficult, fruitless, ineffective task that requires huge expenditures of energy. Anyone who relies solely on inner intention in their interaction with the world thinks too highly of themselves, for in reality, we're all just a single drop in a massive ocean. Outer intention does not try to change the world or fight it. Outer intention simply chooses what it needs from life. In the alternative space, shop, outer intention does not need to haggle for goods or wrangle them out of the shop assistant. You do not have to build up energy to work with outer intention because it is super abundant and all present. We are practically swimming in it. To focus on deliberately accumulating energy is like swimming in a lake filling your cheeks to keep some water in reserve just in case the lake water runs out. Do not try to accumulate energy. Just allow it to pass freely through you in the form of two counter-directional currents. It can be helpful to imagine these two currents joining in counter-directional fountains, but that is all you need to do. Do not strive to become a bundle of energy. Rather, imagine yourself to be a drop in the ocean. Allow your consciousness to feel that it is an integral part of the universe, in oneness with it, and then its entire energy will be at your disposal. Rather than accumulating energy in your body, emerge with the energy of the universe. Expand your sphere of energy and dissolve it into the space around retaining the awareness that in form you are a separate particle. Then by just touching on outer intention with your little finger, you will achieve in a short period of time things that would never have been possible to achieve with the power of inner intention. I'm talking about, of course, about achieving your personal goals, not the intention to rearrange someone's face for one's immediate needs can only be really be met by the power of inner intention. A person should have plenty of free energy if their meridians are not restricted. The meridians suffer two major limitations, the body getting clogged up and continual stress. Energy cannot flow freely if the body is toxic and stress causes the meridians to narrow even further. When the meridians are compromised, short bursts of energy are usually followed by long periods of recovery.
This makes it difficult for a person to live a full active life instead of just eking out a measured existence. As a person get, gets older, they stop developing. Life takes on a slower rhythm. Work with the meridians all that comes to a halt and the meridians gradually atrophy. The meridians are worked at times when life requires you to power intention to its highest level of intensity. We simulate intention. We stimulate intention. And consequently, our meridians, when we work towards life, vital goals. But as soon as the main peaks have been taken, the bar of intention is gradually lowered. The time comes when all you want to do in the evenings and perhaps the day too is to sink into an armchair in front of the television. The meridians narrow the energy of intention fades and life becomes a burden, not a joy. Fortunately, this can all be easily put to rights in a way that does not involve forcing your intention to conquer new peaks. Meridians can be developed by doing energy exercises. The positive effect will be compounded the more that you tune into the feeling of your central energy currents and subtle body. This condition has a number of advantages. It helps induce a feeling of balance and harmony with the world. It increases your sensitivity to changes in the environment and enables you to easily go with the flow. It plugs you into the information field, an unlimited source of creativity. It gives you access to the energy of the cosmos. You radiate harmonious energy, which creates an, an oasis of prosperity and success around you. Most importantly, it keeps you functioning at the meeting point between the heart and mind, bringing you closer to outer intention. Your ability to direct outer intention develops, which means your desires are met more quickly and more easily. You can begin the process of change by turning on the energy fountains from time to time during the day and trying to strengthen them by picturing them in your mind without trying too hard. If during the exercise your head begins to feel heavy, it means the ascending flow is stronger than the descending current. Focus your attention on the de descending current and strengthen it slightly. The energy currents have to be balanced so that they meet halfway up the body. From this point in the body, mentally picture the currents radiating throughout the energy sphere and your sense of the subtle body should become clearer. You'd experience an integral feeling of the ascending and descending currents together with a sense of your entire energy body. If you concentrate your attention on the descending current, your energy center will shift downwards and vice versa. If you concentrate on the ascending current, your energy will accumulate in the upper part of your body. Aside from this, your physical center of gravity will shift in accordance with your energy center. You can use this quality to your advantage in sport. If you require good stability in the legs, such as in skiing, you can strengthen the descending current. Whereas if you need to jump high, you can work on strengthening the ascending current. Martial arts masters have a good understanding of the quality of energy currents in the body. There are other types of energy masters who can stay so firmly fixed to a certain spot when they are concentrating on the descending current that it is impossible to move them. And likewise, there are energy masters who can concentrate on the ascending current and jump to an unimaginable height. The one time that I, I got into martial arts, I had a teacher that at one of the beginning of his classes, he sat down on the ground and said, I will show you the power that I'm able to accumulate through my presence. And he called it presence. But at just sitting there, he asked us to come and push him down to the ground while sitting. He was anchored into the ground. Nobody could move him. Multiple people came up and pushed him and tried to push him. He was so strongly anchored, I'll never forget that. And I think that was what was going. His downward current was anchored in. You can practice paying attention to the central meridians when doing any kind of physical exercise. Just do not try too hard. Being overly diligent never pays off. From time to time, from your inner sight to the area just in front of the spine, imagine the ascending current rising and descending current moving downwards. 
if you regularly practice running your central meridians you will gradually develop the skill of feeding them it might seem as if some movements are totally at odds with how you're visualizing your energy be patient with time you'll learn to easily correlate any movement with a sense of your energy flow concentrating your attention on the central meridians during weight training can significantly increase your energy levels during the inner exertion stage a lift focus your attention on the muscles then when you make the opposite movement and the muscles relax shift your attention to the central meridians the moment of relaxing the muscles should be held for one or two seconds to give sufficient time to feel the energy of the mo- movement of energy take pulling on the bar as an example at the start of the lift the breath is held then the breath is completed and followed by an out breath attention is focused on the exertion then on the return there is an in breath the muscles relax and attention shifts to the central meridians during the return imagine your energy moving simultaneously in both directions you should fully extend the arms and hang with arms relaxed for one or two seconds at this point you should clearly sense the flow of energy as if it had been suddenly freed and was gradually beginning to move do not try to quicken the flow of energy when the muscles are relaxed let go and allow the currents to pass freely in contrast the central meridians can be pushed with force when doing press-ups once you have positioned your hands on the floor with your elbows bent on the out breath mentally picture pushing the energy hard do the in breath and out breath in any order you feel comfortable with to avoid creating unnecessary tension but in the majority of strength building exercises the breath is held or the out breath is made at the exertion stage and the in breath at the relax stage at relaxation stage you stimulate the strengthening of the meridians just by giving them your attention alternate contractions and relaxation will stimulate them further if you direct your attention properly at the stage of contraction the meridians stop and tighten like springs during relaxation the springs straighten and the power of energy flow increases after contraction accumulated compressed energy is released and literally forces its way through the central meridians increasing your energy levels not only gives you more vitality it increases your power of influence the quality of your energy becomes richer which can be very useful when you need to influence or persuade someone of something techniques exist that enable a person to exert dominant energetic influence over others however these techniques contradict the principle of transurfing which asserts that we have the right to choose not the right to change things the world does not need to be pressured or fought and taking this approach is a highly ineffective way of achieving your goals as you know the world usually responds to being pressured by pressuring in return the higher your energy levels the better people will treat you because subconsciously they will sense your energy and even to some extent benefit from it however the majority of people do not feed on personal energy deliberately like pendulums do it's as if they are simply swimming in your energy because your fountains are abundantly overflowing people inevitably become well disposed towards you because you are providing them with a source of excess energy people are used to giving their energy away to pendulums that they are always delighted to be on the receiving end so-called magnetic or charismatic personalities are one such sure source it is hardly surprising said people like this are said to have an inexplicable charm or magnetism what would you find more attractive a pool of stagnating water or a pure spring there is no need to worry that other people are using your energy the small quantity of excess energy you give away to others will only work in your favor when you're waiting for a very important meeting abandon importance and activate your central meridians until they are flowing in fountains 
when your energy is running well, you do not need half as many clever words and convincing arguments. Simply turn on the fountains. By drawing free energy towards you and letting it pass through your energy body, you make the same energy available to others. They will be able to feel it on a subconscious level and without being aware of the reason, they will feel well disposed towards you. The secret of your charm will be a mystery to them. So that's very interesting. And even though I thought I wasn't going to do a meditation, I think that would be a perfect one. Guided process for us to let our fountains flow. And so I will definitely be creating something like that. I think that's perfect is to let your fountains flow. And that will expand your central meridians. The energy of attention, of intention, is the next section. And as we said at the beginning, energy enters the human body in the form of central currents of energy, flow, which are programmed by a person's thoughts, and on exiting the body adopt the same parameters as the person's thoughts. The programmed energy builds up in the corresponding sector of the alternative space, which causes that reality alternative to be realized materially. So this is a very important sentence and I want to read it again because this is explaining how reality is created with energy okay so just understand the programmed energy builds up in the corresponding sector of the alternative space which causes that reality alternative to be realized materially as we said in the beginning energy enters the human body in the form of central currents of energy which are programmed by a person's thoughts on exiting the body adopt the same parameters of the person's thoughts so every ounce of energy that's coming into your body is programmed by your intention take control of that you can fulfill basic actions in the material world with the power of inner intention but the material realization of a potential reality in the alternative space can only be powered by outer intention or as you might call it god when he says outer intention he's talking about outward things changing reality shifts in the universe around you generated when the heart and mind are unified in their aspirations the power of outer intention is proportional to your energy levels outer intention is a total commitment combined with high energetic potential energy levels can be increased by training the central meridians and cleansing the body transurfing also recommends another excellent technique to widen the channels visualizing the process you need to have some initial intention to increase the energy of intention the technique involves following affirmations my channels are widening and my energy intention energy is increasing during the energy exercise visualize the affirmation as a process As you know, the essence of the visualization technique lies in the statement that today is better than yesterday, and tomorrow will be better than today. Switch on your energy fountains and repeat the affirmation in your mind that your intention energy is increasing with every passing day. This way, intention will support itself and your energy levels will increasingly rise. Do not forget that the intention to improve your biofield must be purified of importance and desire potentials diligence and gusto in the attempt to enhance the energy flow will cause the reverse and create a block intention relies on focus not gusto it is only by focusing on the process that you achieve the desired result performing the exercises with maximum effort is a waste of time and energy if the mind is busy dreaming of something else whilst you are doing them loosen the grip of diligence and focus on action the next section is the step of intention now imagine an average newborn brought into a society where people age very slowly and live to the age of around 300 years old how long do you think the child will live for what I'm trying to say is that the birth from birth people are taught the standard script that health deteriorates with age the body withers and in the end we all die 
which can undoubtedly be explained by standard physiological causes. However, if you look at the aging process from the point of view of transurfing, it is really just another induced transition. Check out my episode on induced transitions. You could even say that aging is the lengthiest induced transition we experience occurring slowly but very surely. The aging script is so familiar and obvious that it would never occur to anyone to doubt it. All attempts to change the script have been reduced to the discovery of all sorts of elixirs. Even the achievements of contemporary pharmacology and genetics fail to deliver tangible results. One can only conclude that the physiological factor comprises just one portion of the aging process. Exactly what portion the induced transition accounts for is impossible to say. But that does not really matter. The important thing is to be conscious of the fact that the transition exists. From the early childhood, we are convinced that the aging process is inevitable. Over the course of a person's life, they receive endless confirmation of the aging process from their very own personal experience and the experience of others. At every birthday celebration, theatrical demonstrations of good wishes are made calling for good health and longevity, but everyone knows that these good wishes mean nothing and have absolutely no impact on the script. On the contrary, translated into the language of fact, what these well-meaning words are really saying is that your health is far from what it used to be and the years are passing. These are the slight oscillations or flirtations of a destructive pendulum. Sooner or later, you will begin to feel that 10 years or so ago, you had so much more strength and energy You still want to share these thoughts, but someone else, that someone will instantly appear to enthusiastically develop the topic of conversation. The theme of illness is no less popular in polite small talk now than the weather. By participating in such conversations, you radiate energy at the same frequency as the destructive pendulum i.e. you agree to play the game. The pendulum may send you a prod in the form of exhaustion or malaise. Now that's an interesting quote when Zeeland says the pendulum may prod you in the form of exhaustion or malaise. He is implying, and I don't think he's implied that before, that the pendulums can actually directly affect your health. Not you as a result. He's saying that the pendulums can prod you by that. Your condition will worry you deeply and you'll think to yourself, I must be unwell. This is your response to the pendulum sway. Having received a bout of energy, the pendulum prods you again, making it hurt even more. You go to the doctor who confirms your illness and the process continues to unfold. The pendulum receives energy and sways even harder. By the time the crisis hits, the pendulum will already have taken everything it can take, leaving you alone to begin your recovery. If, of course, the induced transition has not thrown its victim into an invalid lifeline. Does this mean that you should not go to the doctor or take any medicine and should refuse all help in coping with your illness? No! To refuse a possible cure for an illness that has reached a developed stage is irresponsible and reckless, and certainly no way to leave the game. The issue is how to avoid being drawn into the game in the first place. You may comment to a colleague, I have not seen you for a while. 
why were you not at your work? To which your colleague will undoubtedly answer, I was ill. Note they do not say they were healing. They say they were ill. To the question, what is wrong? The answer will be, I am ill. Of course, it would sound unnatural to answer these questions with, I was healing. People are so used to playing the illness game that cure is seen as an attribute or side effect of the game, but not a goal in its own right. The pendulum's game begins with you willingly accepting the symptoms of the illness. In other words, gripping the end of the spiral of an induced transition. The pendulum's first push can be defeated if you do not take the symptoms seriously. Quietly turn away and there and then and forget about them. If that does not work, you can still the pendulum sway by taking basic preventive measures. If you do get sick, play the treatment game, not the illness game. To play the illness game means to suffer passively, to take part in conversations about various maladies, to whinge, to complain, to capriciously demand care and sympathy from those around you, to consider your malaise an indispensable attribute, to flaunt your ill health like a child that must be constantly fussed over, and to eagerly seek out information connected with various ailments. To play the healing game means to take active inner interest in possible cures, to make efforts to live a healthy lifestyle, to treat your illness with humor, and to focus your attention on improving how you feel, striving towards health and communicating with like-minded individuals. You can see that these are two totally different games. In the illness game, you participate in the role of passive victim radiating energy at the frequency of the destructive pendulum. The vortex of the induced transition drags you ever closer to its center. In the healing game, you participate as a proactive creator and master of your own life, ruling your own destiny and thereby shifting onto healthy lifelines. If you're already trying to play the healing game, ask yourself whether you're playing it sufficiently sincerely. The problem is that it's so easy to kid yourself. You might not you might know in your mind that you should be leading a healthy lifestyle, giving up bad habits, getting more physical exercise and eating good foods. But in reality, old habits die hard. You try to follow the rules of a healthy lifestyle because you know it will be good for you. But in the end, laziness gets in the way and you just cannot be bothered. This is not a clean game. That is the I am ill and they will make me better game. On an energetic level, the game is no different from the illness game because you're playing at healing from a position of duress rather than personal conviction. When the intention is neither clear or clean nor sincere, the results will be the same. Attempts made by representatives of the fair sex to lose weight are a perfect illustration of a tainted game. They torture themselves with diets, forcing themselves to do the unwanted to get rid of the weight. They abhor their weight and figure, which, as you know, is the perfect requirement to radiate energy at the frequency of lifelines where their weight and figure will be exactly the way they currently feel about them. Women do not actually like their diets. They would much rather have the food they usually eat. If this is the game you're playing, abandon self-coercion. At best, it will bring temporary minor results. Self-coercion frightens the subconscious, which makes it resist. In the end, the subconscious will have its own way, so you can expect to ditch the diet and gain even more weight than before. How are, how are the people listening? How do you feel about that? Do you notice that there are times when you work out and it's not helping you? 
and when you or when you go on a diet in a, in a certain way and you end up gaining more because of the energy that you're putting into it and what you're telling your subconscious the only conclusion worth drawing is that if you want to be healthy and beautiful you have to change your lifestyle this means giving up old habits and acquiring new ones not from necessity but from a place of conviction you must have strong motivation and intention and your intention must be pure you cannot hope to radiate energy at the frequency of healthy lifelines or to transition to these lifelines if you do the same as you've always done it is not as difficult as it might seem to make a change in lifestyle changing old habits is a matter of intention and time and not much time at that the choice is yours which brings us to the chapter on illness pendulum pendulums the section everyone has been ill at some point in their life being ill usually brings a mass of problems and anxieties with it making one prone to negative thoughts and emotions this energy then emanates through your personal space providing fertile soil for the development of pendulums related illnesses that absorb negative energy so efficiently pendulums generated by illness are among the most powerful of all pendulums they are primarily the diseases and epidemics themselves as well as the various pendulums of the medical world that stand in opposition to them he is saying that the pendulums are primarily the diseases and epidemics themselves that stand in opposition to them. You can imagine what influential structures these encompass: whole clinics, sanatoriums, research agencies, factories, pharmacies, educational institutions. The medical pendulums declare their goal to be the battle against disease. In practice, this battle generates a massive spectrum of negative phenomenon characteristic of a destructive pendulum because their main idea is still to hold on to existing adherents and attract new ones. For example, classic medicine is hostile to all traditional healing methods. IE any method not belonging to it. Any criticism of outdated or mistaken ideas originating from adherence of alternative healing methods is automatically proclaimed unscientific. Any new age healing method will be met with extreme cynicism. In turn, adherents of alternative medicine have nothing against throwing the odd stone into the garden of the orthodox should it come to that. No one gripped by the leverage of an illness or medicine pendulum can reclaim the feeling of their youth or the time in their life when health related issues were the last thing on their mind if your health is not causing you any problems you just do not give it any thought and consequently your energy lacks the kind of frequency characteristic of illness pendulums to one degree or another every one becomes gradually more susceptible to pendulums with age once you begin radiating energy at the frequency of the pendulum you lose energy and create dependency which facilitates your transition to lifeline saturated with illness to reclaim your former state of health all ties with pendulums must be cut to cut the ties you have to block any information generated by illness pendulums and refuse to participate in their games ie applying the approach of defeating the pendulum if you're seriously ill you should play the healing game and care for your whole body applying the approach of st- of stilling the pendulum sway everyday drug companies show advertisements featuring happy people depending on a certain medicine for their health and because they have their health they're highly successful in all areas of their life it is a tempting carrot and works every time because as we have already discussed the majority of people live their lives in a semi-conscious state your brain is programmed to go to the chemist take the medicine and receive your reward complete order in all your affairs 
But that is the least of it. There is another deeper, more insidious program that is subtly planned, planted into the advertising. Think about it. The people shown in the adverts are generally normal, attractive, and thoroughly successful individuals. Are they really any better than you? All these individuals have some kind of health problem, but quickly recover thanks to the medicine that they are taking. And you are the same. It is drummed into our conscious and subconscious minds that we are all either predisposed to illness, are ready to sick, or will soon come down with something, and most people accept their game conditions. This is the true face as opposed to the declared face of the destructive pendulum. Its true task is not to cure the individual, but to claim them as an adherent, to successfully convey the idea that they are all ill and therefore must take their medicine. Another curious method used to attract adherence is a poor weather forecast. The core of the forecast is made up of information on magnetic storms, fluctuations in atmospheric pressure, and other adverse factors. Note these phenomena occur to one degree or another practically on a daily basis. A prognosis is then formed on the basis of these data detailing which health issues will be most affected by the weather conditions and who can expect to justify to, to particularly suffer the day or next. At first it is amusing to hear the pendulum almost choking its way through the list of illnesses and inevitable consequences for those who suffer from them. Then it seems freakishly disturbing as it dawns on you what terribly destructive thought patterns are being programmed into the minds of conscious and less conscious individuals who are already unwell. When you hear such a negative prognosis, you might think that it would be better not to go out of the house at all. And that you might as well get ready to climb into your own grave. It is natural that adverse factors will have some effect on our health, but why create the expectation from the very outset? Many people, particularly the elderly, listen to the pendulum's effusions and program themselves beforehand for ailments and aggravations as if they had been sentenced to suffering. The weather forecast and its prognosis for ill health is a perfect illustration of the pendulum's brazen and cynical desire to subjugate people to its will. The most classical topic is the conversations we have with friends and relatives about our health. As a rule, the conversation does not focus on the theme of strengthening one's health. It centers around the theme of illness and medication. One gleefully describes how they suffer from various ailments and the other readily grunts in response that this is what happens when you get a bit long in the tooth. People who participate in this kind of conversation actively radiate energy at the frequency of illness pendulums and their energy is just as infectious as pathogenic microbes. Avoid this kind of company otherwise the frequencies of illnesses will unexpectedly creep up on you. It is easy to spot an illness pendulum. It lures you with information about various diseases and their treatments. If you decide to ignore the information and let it pass, without taking it so seriously, the pendulums will be discouraged and leave you alone. This is its defeat. If you respond to the information with healthy laughter and take a couple of digs at its pendulum will bolt in terror in the opposite direction. This is the stilling of the pendulum sway. By parting with illness pendulums, you become completely free. But the freedom does not last for long. It is human nature to want to become the adherent of one pendulum or another. And so sooner or later, 
you will again risk falling under the influence of their illnesses to protect yourself you have to shift out of the state of limbo that can set in once you have sided with recovery pendulums that govern everything related to strengthening the body and spirit become an adherent of a healthy lifestyle you will see how joyful and exciting it is compared with the dull burdensome battle with the disease obviously if a person consistently takes good care of themselves they will radiate energy at the frequency of healthy lifelines and be far too busy to have anything to do with illness you can see that there are two completely contrasting lifestyles one based on healing illnesses and on and the other on looking after your health clearly in relation to ill health the first relates to inner intention and the second to outer intention which lifestyle will you live is entirely your choice so it's interesting this chapter a lot of different law of attraction practitioners and metaphysical authors deal with the topic of health of course dr joe dispenza becoming the placebo is wonderful and brings in the science of neurology into it so this idea that the pendulums are the primary cause of illness i don't necessarily agree with i do think that pendulums can be caused by illness but i'm not sure if it feels like a pendulum can cause sickness it still feels like that's something that we create ourselves but i'd like to get your opinion on his belief of this this major power of illness pendulums i believe that there's definitely something there with all even any corporation and and but the pendulums may be ill-defined is it the hospital that's a pendulum i guess they're all different pendulums so you have the pharmaceutical companies that's a pendulum you have the hospital the pendulum and i get that there's a shift to a focus on illnesses and that makes sense but i'd love to hear what you think about that so in summary of this chapter physiological energy is spent on the execution of physical action and intention depends on free energy remember at the beginning of the chapter there was two different kinds of energy and there's the physiological and free energy the energy that's all around us that we're ignoring as we drink our coffee free energy passes through the body in a two opposing currents the energy of intention is blocked when you're stressed and to get rid of stress wake up and drop importance if reducing importance is not possible there is no point in wasting energy to trying to relax if you can strengthen your protective shield by performing energy exercises and do not try to accumulate energy just let it freely pass through you high energy levels depend on wide central meridians performing energy exercises is an effective way of strengthening the meridians cleansing the body will significantly widen the meridians inner intention is focused on being ill and getting better outer intention is focused on leading a healthy lifestyle never accept the game of destructive illness pendulums and during the exercise just pay attention to the central meridians intention lies in focused concentration not gusto and diligence and that is the chapter on energy a wonderful chapter notice that in this chapter and it, it i'm considering doing this in my book now that i'm having a chance to go through a final edit you know that he doesn't use the word chakras he uses the word meridians and there is sort of a, a minor negative connotation to chakras now i reference chakras and i have uh, uh, several meditations created around awakening chakras but in many ways the word meridian seems to resonate with me chakras seem to have a magical magical implication that um that they rotate they call them the wheels of life and i and i get that but at the same time sometimes the understanding of chakras is different they're treated like magical things these are nerve bundles that are built into our central nervous system that are near major organs that have sensory complexes that will naturally have energy and these energy meridians flow just like a like a hose 
outside when you're watering your plants and there's a kink in the hose and so these meridians can get kinked and so widening the meridians allows for free flow of energy so definitely going to have another episode soon where I go over my energy routine again I have an energy routine that I do before I meditate and it's just become a lifesaver for me Uh, certified health nut who talks about doing qigong and has a great channel that I recommend says if you know if you do a gong which is a set of energy exercises for a hundred days it becomes a permanent template in your body and I believe that and I think that you can do energy exercises that that will permanently widen your meridians check out my awakening energy uh, that make awakening energy meditation is a long one and it does use uh, several different techniques to open up energies including mantras which some people believe have an effect and it's certainly worth experimenting with you want to find an energy routine that resonates with you energy can seem complicated we have more than just our chakras we have the nadis which are energy centers that are in our arms and face that can be activated and circulated there's so much to learning about and applying these energy lessons and then also check out my episode on energy on i have a whole other episode on energy i'm fascinated by energy in every way levels of energy as talked about by frederick dotson or discussions of energy that go on to a quantum level and how the energies can associate with each other and the different kinds of energy what do you think is there a different kind of energy when key energy is it a different sort of energy and you've heard of Oregon energy there's so much interesting stuff and there is a book called the uh, apocryphal transurfing by Vadim Zeeland I had a really really bad translation I've thought about doing an episode on it but he talks a lot about some different energy exercises including the five Tibetans he is a big believer in the five Tibetans and that is interesting because that's a big part of my routine and it will be definitely mentioned as part of the routines in my book for quantum jumping one of the keys uh, in jumping into a parallel reality is in looking at the microscopic level on the quantum level electrons for instance that do quantum jumps are jump because a sufficient amount of energy forces them to jump they don't just move and so if you want to move into a different dimension it's not going to be a you're not going to slowly walk into it you have to jump and that jumping requires energy my belief is that there are several different ways to pr- travel through these parallel realities to access the information of parallel realities my beliefs are kind of a hodgepodge that mix in some of the stuff from transurfing but i also believe that they there may be a possibility of multiple physical realities transurfing believes that there's only one physical reality and energy quadrants that determine the future and the past which i i get that i i just have had occurrences but my experience is in moving into these parallel realities which is when you see big big shifts in manifestations is with energy and so if you want to have really terrific experience in composing your reality then you need to tune into your energy what kind of energy are we working with what level of energy and also energy cords are you connected in energy to people around you to places to things they're like filaments and cords that are drawing and giving energy to things all around you and so you can consolidate these energies and look at these energy flows it's all very interesting stuff and this particular chapter does go over quite a bit of it the discussion of illness and energy is true and 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 here's my question to you have we hypnotically as with through a, a level of of a feedback loop of some kind a societal feedback loop do you think we've collectively put ourselves so that we are dying way younger than we should because of these common beliefs given to us from pendulums and people from the moment that we're born that we're going to die at a certain age i believe in the in the reality creation model that anything is possible that if everybody believed people could fly that we would start to fly i know that's a super crazy belief but i believe that that the 
there is coherent belief by many people that you can't be older than a certain age. And that belief system is pulling our planet into a frequency where we don't live as long. And eventually we're going to figure this out. And then there's going to be people in the future. And it's not going to be from some new healing equipment that, or medicine that comes up. People are going to start understanding frequencies and vibrations, the power of their mind to shift into realities of different levels of health. And when this happens, as Cynthia Sue Larson documents in her book, Quantum Jumping, uh, the, this is directly affecting your health. I mean, we all know the feeling when, when your mom kissed and made it better. We, we quantum jumped into another reality and we can have huge jumps with energy. And this chapter really gives a concise and good idea of the different kind of energies that we can use physiologically and free and how they interact in the world and with us and how we use energy and the in, and the energy of intention and how that is used as well. It's always a pleasure to go over these chapters and I always learn so much and it's a joy to share it with you. So please leave your comments and make sure you subscribe to my channel. We're getting close to, to the to thousand subscribers. Who's going to be the magical thousand subscriber? We got so many cool things on the horizon, some fantastic meditations and interviews that are coming. The path forward looks infinite. If you need coaching, I would love to coach you one-on-one. -on -one. Go to my website at advancedsuccessinstitute.com and all episodes of The Reality Revolution can be found at therealityrevolution.com. Calm. It's always a pleasure. I'm wishing you the very best day after listening to this with the most abundant amounts of energy, allowing you to shift and surf into joyous and incredible realities, riding waves of fortune. Welcome to the reality revolution. <laughs>